Thank you to all the thousand fans here in our live audience, and the tens of thousands of you joining online. We're happy to be here today. Uh, yeah, so we'll be talking about uh, from storming to performing, uh, growing your project's contributor experience. Uh, I'm Matt Butcher. Uh, I lead a team at Microsoft uh, called Deus Labs. We do a lot of open source development, have done a lot of community work. Uh, we built Helm and Brigade and CNAB and Porter and a whole uh, litany of other projects. Most recently, we've been working on Crustlet and some WebAssembly-based projects. Uh, and I was one of the uh, uh, original authors of the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. I still don't even know how to yeah. say it. The Illustrated <laughs> Children's Guide to Kubernetes. Yeah. And this is my co-author. Hi, I'm Karen. I am a community program manager at Microsoft. Um, externally, I do a lot of work in the CNCF space. Um, I'm a member of the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee, and I'm also a bootstrap member of the CNCF tag focused on contributor strategy. Um, and then at Microsoft, I am a community manager for Matt's team. Um, like you mentioned, we worked on the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes book series together. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at KarenH2. So where we're going to start today isn't necessarily with how you get started writing your open source project. We really wanted to start more with once you have a project and you start turning your attention toward community building and how you start to get those first contributors and how you kind of work your way through this process. We've done it ourselves many times. More importantly, we've learned from a lot of other people around us uh, how to do things well and, and how to get people highly involved. But where we wanted to start today, and the kind of framing for our presentation, uh, was with a psychologist who in 1965, uh, Bruce Tuckman surveyed the psycho psychological literature on how groups form and then how they become productive. And Tuckman analyzes all of this literature and at the end sort of believes that he sees a pattern that is common to almost all kinds of groups that form. And he says there are, there are four very distinctive phases. It's forming, followed by storming, followed by norming, and concluding with performing. Uh, now, if you've read any literature on like getting a company started up or how to do group therapy or things like this, you are likely to at least run into this theory somewhere along the line. But we thought it might be fun to just kind of see how it applied to open source projects. So that's what we'd like to talk about today. And we'll go through each of these. So in the forming phase, this is the first one. This is when uh, you, know, you introduce something out there and people are excited about it. And you're all kind of together going, oh, this is great. Now, how do we get started? We've got so much energy and we just want to get going. So in the first one, I'm going to have to look up there because yeah. I can't see. Uh, contributing code in this first phase is one of the first things you're going to want to figure out. And uh, I mean, maybe that sounds obvious, but it is actually a really crucial step when you open up that community for the first time to come up with a way to sort of welcome people in. So it can be hard sometimes when the first couple of issues or first couple of pull requests come in and they don't feel right to you, right? And you're like, ah, oh, they didn't get it. Or, oh, I can't believe this is the kind of thing that, that, that people are. And you can sort of naturally take offense. But during this phase, the thing you want to do to foster this kind of forming phase is to, say, is to get, uh, get yourself all psyched up to, to create a welcoming and open atmosphere for those kinds of things. Because those represent people who are using your software and then, and then who want to help you get better. Uh, we had some rules when we were doing Helm uh, where we, we acknowledged, we agreed, the Helm core maintainers agreed in those early days that each time a new pull request would come in, even if the pull request was in pretty rough shape, we would try and lead off with a good positive comment because we felt like that helped us as contributors say, look, we recognize that our, our, main, uh, our main job as a core committer is to get people involved and it helped validate for them, yes, we recognize that you just put in a lot of time on this. Um, next is having a website. So it's important to settle on your branding and your messaging early on. Um, and this is for you know, your team and also like to, to project outwards, right? Because it's like, if you can't figure this stuff out, why would so someone else understand what your project is about? And so from our experiences, we have found that using Netlify or GitHub pages is a quick and easy way to get started. And then as for com communications, um, think about where your team is and where your larger community already exists and kind of jump on in there. That way the barrier to entry, uh, the barrier to entry is smaller. Um, and then yeah, set up dedicated channels to hold conversations. 
Again, this is something you want to figure out early on and be intentional with because once you kind of set up these channels, you're a bit committed. Um, we've had a few, or I, I've worked on a project before where we're like, we're like, oh, like we'll do our own um, Slack Slack org, right? And then later on, we we're like, no, it makes more sense for us to move this into the CNCF Slack. And with that, we definitely lost some people having to migrate our community over. So again, think about this early on before you actually need to address any problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another one that might, I, I get the obvious points. I get, you get the hard ones and I get the easy ones. Uh, <laughs> maintaining documentation is another good thing to do for your community. Uh, and maybe that sounds self-evident and I, I hope it does actually. But again, you know, in those early days of getting the project going, it's a good time to frequently revisit at least a couple pieces of documentation. The quick start guide, uh, Carolyn uh, von Sleeps, Von, uh, now I can't pronounce her name, Von Sli Slick on our team, is great about reminding us, hey, uh, the, the quick start guide is the first thing anybody's gonna look at. Revisit it with each release, make sure it's still in good shape. And, uh, and, and that's just a great thing because when people can come through and get from the zero to dopamine hit really quickly, they're likely to stay around. The other good one is maintainer guide, to keep the maintainer guide up to date uh, because the first time anybody tries to do their first pull request, uh, that's the first thing they're going to look at. So again, it's all about removing barriers of entry in this forming phase. Cool. Storm. The, the, uh, the less fun uh, topic is the storming phase. So every group starts out you know, enthusiastic and you're starting in that building phase, but inevitably at some point you're going to run into differences of opinion, uh, confusion about what should be done. And the storming phase uh, describes that phase where for the first time interpersonal conflict sort of enters the arena. And this can be kind of a make or break phase for any group and an open source community is no exception. So we wanted to talk about some different things that you could do to, to you know, streamline that process and hopefully build in some mechanisms. Um, so I think this goes without saying, but you know, I wanna be explicit, disputes are unavoidable. Um, you know, you wanna set the right expectations for you and your team by acknowledging that like you will very well set have dis disputes at some point, um, and they're okay to have. The worst thing you can do is ignore them and be caught off guard. So just know that they're gonna happen and that's fine. Um, the next is the code of conduct. Um, I serve on a code of conduct committee and I highly recommend that you have one for your project. Um, again, this is one of those things you wanna have this before you really like need to have it, um, before there are any incidents. And this not only protects you, it protects your project and it protects your community. Um, and I know for some people, they think that this is, you know, that there's a lot of work that goes into this stuff, but you don't have to create this from scratch. There are lots of examples out there like the CNCF code of conduct that you can adopt for your projects. Um, and then next is governance. So a governance doc basically provides rules of engagement around things like decision making and voting for a project. And you know, sometimes users will decide whether or not they want to participate or use your project based on this, um, especially if there's things around like, um, if it's like one company controlling a project, right? And so this is something, again, you wanna think about before there's a problem. Um, and um, this, yeah, take some time, think about this early on and involve all the stakeholders that might be involved or that yeah, have a stake in it. I think that in both of those cases, the code of conduct and governance, those are the areas where some really big issues can come in and really do substantial damage to a project at any point. And that's why you wanna make sure to have those two. But then, uh, then again, I get the easy one, right? Coding standards are another way to kind of stop like the mundane issues, right? Where uh, a PR opens and you feel like you're almost like bickering about where the paren goes or how you do semicolons or where the white spaces are. And you as a, as a core maintainer and as a project creator uh, can very simply create some guides that say, hey, use this formatter over your code. Hey, we tend to follow these particular idioms. It's best even if you can point to an established set, uh, like the Go programming language has a really good established set of programming idioms that you can point to. And what you're doing isn't so much being an enforcer trying to kind of heavy handedly lay down. What you're trying to do is remove a ground that could otherwise lead to sort of nitpicky little, uh, little problems that could then, you know how things occasionally snowball in issues or comment threads and before long everything's blown out of proportion. If you can just remove a whole layer of those problems, 
then the core maintainers are really focusing more on the substance of what's being asked and, and the pull request. And, uh, and conversely, your contributors are going, okay, I feel like I know coming into it what's expected of me. Yeah, maybe I would have put my parents somewhere else, but I understand that that's what they want to do to keep their code clean, and it just removes that whole area. So I think that's a nice, easy way uh, to establish something that can solve problems. Now, the last one is really something we have to remind ourselves of sometimes, especially when we start projects, that there's a distinct difference between a contributor and an employee, right? And sometimes, it, as you get, you know, in that, in that kind of heady early days of a project, you get really excited and people come in and start committing and, and start changing the code. And, you get, and then you start thinking of those people as employees, right? Using that model where you're like, oh, I need you to do this. I need you to, do, can you get this done by Tuesday? You know, and uh, it's easy to get a little heavy handed on that side. Uh, which becomes unfair to these people and, and it is a, uh, not the way we should be looking at them, right? Respecting volunteers as people who have very graciously given of their time and talent is, of course, what we all aspire to be. But we as maintainers often have to take a look at ourselves as we head out of that forming and into the storming period and go, uh, okay, I need to remember to thank people for this and not put pressure on them. Ask when they feel like they might have it done rather than tell them when I need it done and things like that. So now we move on into the, into the third phase. So it's forming, storming, and then norming. And in the norming phase, this is when the group dynamic really changes more to saying, okay, all right, now we know how to work together, uh, or now we know how to solve problems. How do we work together to sort of uh, head toward the optimal, right? How do, we, uh, how do we kind of codify how things are done in this project with the purpose of making it easy for us to continue on? Uh, one thing that we can do for that is revisit how we do issue management, right? And that first time when we're talking about forming, we're talking about trying to get people to submit issues and make them feel comfortable. Well, you know, if your project's doing well, all of a sudden you don't, you don't necessarily feel the need to get people to uh, start filing issues. You really start going, this is a lot of issues. I'm not really sure how I can keep up with it. So at this point, then you start figuring out strategies for triaging. Uh, we use labels a lot for some of our projects and, uh, and, and try and categorize things early, triage on a regular cycle and prevent things from building up. And again, the purpose of this is not so much, uh, is, is not so much, and really the purpose of many of these things in the norming phase isn't so much individualist, individualist. It's not about me. It's about how the core maintainers who are becoming a group can start to sort through uh, amount of big amounts of information very efficiently and in a way they all agree upon. So labeling issues is a super, super convenient way for somebody to be able to go through and triage things really quickly. And then when somebody else has time, they can come back through and say, okay, I'm gonna look for a bug. Oh, these three are labeled bug. That one's labeled small. I'm gonna grab a small bug and work on that today. And that helps everybody streamline things without everybody having to do sort of the redundant work of reading every issue in the queue. Um, Delegating work. Delegating work. Uh, as the project grows, it's going to become increasingly important to figure out how you're going to parcel stuff out among the maintainers of the project. Uh, so uh, Helm's a good example of that, and Adam's sitting in the front row so I can pick on him. You know, as we got going in here, it started to be a bigger and bigger deal for Adam and I and Michelle to go around to other people and say, hey, we noticed you've been contributing in the issue queue a lot. You've opened a bunch of pull requests. How do you feel about becoming a core maintainer? And you start building out in this norming phase a process by which you can identify people around you who are going to be productive for the project, healthy for the community, and, and then uh, you know, kind of delegate out that, that work to them. Uh, and then make it clear how they can claim work and make it clear how, what the expectations are to working together. And that's when you really start to see the project as a whole strengthen. Right? You don't have to tackle that right up front in the forming phase, but by about this phase, that's when, the, when these problems become real and they can be solved with this kind of uh, introspective look at how you want to grow the team. Um, so you also want to standardize communication channels, and this is for everyone's sake. Um, figure out what needs to be private with maintainers versus transparent with the community. Again, this goes back to building trust. 
um, and use your dedicated communication channels as intended. Um, and this is for consistency and trust. <laughs> and if and when you outgrow your channels, um, such as with Slack, consider splitting it for the sake of organization. Um, again, using Helm as an example, we used to just have a Helm channel. Um, but then, you know, it got a bit noisy. We started having developers in there and users. And so we ended up splitting the channel into a Helm dev and Helm users channel, again, just for organization and clarity. Um, so think about that. And if and when you need to do that, do it as soon as possible. Um, and then also just um, for, you know, when it comes to communications, you want to document for the future, right? Like you're not always going to have the exact same people working on your project. So you want to kind of leave a paper trail for the people who come into the project later down the line so they can get caught up and just, again, transparency, trust, all of that good stuff. So we start with forming, then we go on and we deal with interpersonal conflict and storming. Then we get to this place where we're really starting to solve process problems and that's the norming phase. And then the final phase that Tuckman identified was called performing. And the idea here is that the group is sort of settled into their thing. Right? And we understand how we work together. We've hit stride on a lot of things. We know what our, uh, in, in the case of an open source project like this, right, what the day-to-day -day cadence looks like for things. Uh, how we version, how we do this, how we do that. The last phase, the performing phase, is really about making sure that we can perpetuate everything we've just built and, and continue it on and keep everything kind of healthy over the long term. So the first one on this list then becomes what do we need to do to keep the people that we have on the project, right? Uh, we're all at this point, I think, painfully aware of the impact of burnout. And one of the things about maintaining an open source project, which I'm sure will come as no surprise to any of you, is that it can be really stressful to manage things like issue queues, right? Nobody comes, well, I shouldn't say nobody. Very rarely does anybody come to the issue queue just to say, hey, I'm not frustrated with this project and it's really working well for me, right? When they show up in the issue queue, they're there because they've already hit something that is driving, uh, driving them to, uh, to, to complain, right? Or to point out a flaw or to ask for help. And you can oftentimes get people who show up and lay their frustration right out there in, in print. And it can be very tiring. And uh, uh, burnout among open source developers can be a really tough one because uh, when you're volunteering on a project and people get kind of hostile and you take it personally, all of which are natural things, right? The natural tendency to, to react to that is, well, this was my free time. Why am I spending my free time on this? I could spend my free time on something else. So it became a very important thing to, for us to figure out ways of expressing appreciation to core maintainers, uh, help them feel uh, appreciated and help them feel uh, uh, valued. And Karen had often done really cool things like create some sort of uh, special, special swag to give specifically to core maintainers. You know, here's a t-shirt, here's, uh, we gave out, we've done awards. We did puzzles. We did puzzles <laughs> one time, but just stuff to say, look, we recognize that you're in it to volunteer. You know, here's a basket of chocolate bars to express our appreciation. Things like that can just go a long way. Uh, just to let people know that they're feeling appreciated. Um, and then again, just kind of acknowledging that like people will eventually move on. You want to actively always be thinking about the future, right? So um, treat your current maintainers well <laughs> because that will encourage new people um, to step, as, step up as contributors and then also ideally become maintainers down the line. Um, and just be honest with yourself about this. Um, Think, yeah, just always be thinking about how you can bring in new contributors before you need to. I guess that's kind of my current theme right now for this whole talk. Yep. Think about things before you need to. Um, so yeah, um, as an example, we did our Helm Contributor Summit earlier this year. And with that, we did workshops for people who are new to the project um, to get them caught up to speed on how to contribute to the project. And then um, we also used that as an opportunity to identify current maintainers that we felt like had potential to become maintainers, reached out to them, and then we're like currently working working um, with them and mentoring them to become maintainers. And this isn't to say that we currently like, you know, are dying for maintainers, but again, it's just like we're getting people in the pipeline set up for success. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and being able to keep that momentum once you've gone through all these other phases to kind of build it, uh, it's, it felt much easier to have a core maintainer summit and say, this is what we've already discovered about it. You know, come on, join us, it's gonna be fun. Uh, but sometimes it is time for people to go, right? And 
Uh, it's not always because of burnout. Oftentimes it's because a job change impacts you or other personal situation. And one of the things that can be hard is for somebody to step down. And uh, sometimes people don't want to step down because they feel a, a, an obligation to continue with the project. Other times they're embarrassed and they just kind of you know, ghost out and you're like, what happened to so-and-so? Uh, when we were dealing with this with Helm, um, something from academia really inspired us. Uh, when you are a faculty member at, a, in, an, at an institution, at a university or something for a long time, and you retire, you don't lose your title of professor. You become an emeritus professor. And this is a title of respect, a kind of way for the department to thank you for your contribution over the years to your particular specialty, to your particular field. And we really liked that idea of, of having a title that was a title of respect, but didn't necessarily carry with it more responsibilities with the project. And so we introduced a Helm uh, Emeritus Maintainer status that when somebody said, you know, it's my time, job change, life change, tired, you know, interest change, whatever, I, I, I kind of need to step back. Then we would give them this title, Emeritus Maintainer, and they would go in the code owner's file in the Emeritus uh, Maintainer. And that meant that from then on out, they knew that when they put on a resume, yeah, I worked on Helm or yeah, I worked on Brigade or something like that, they would be able to point back to the file in the repo and say, see, I'm, I'm, I'm still listed here, right? And other people would be able to go, oh yeah, I know that person. They, I didn't know they worked on this project. And there's this like sense of respect and, uh, and honor in uh, being able to recognize the work that people did. So we, uh, we coined that title. That's something that I really hope other projects do as, as well because I just think it's a really cool way to thank people for, uh, for concerted effort and, and uh, again, volunteering their time and their talent. All right, so now we're at the conclusion. And, you know, basically we want to say that in reality, open source projects aren't static, right? Like we presented this model to you, but at the same time, not all the projects that you work with will go through these phases or at the same pace. Um, and so sometimes we move back and forth through this model and all of that is okay. Um, we just hope that we've been able to provide you with some tools, techniques and context um, to help you figure out these phases for yourself. Yeah, and when, when Tuckman was writing that article, uh, you know, he was thinking very much of a group as sort of a static body that went through a, a static period of time. Open source projects tend to go longer and have more variety than I think what those early studies he looked at would have indicated. And because of that, right, the changes can happen anytime you shake up who's the core maintainer or, or even when you do a major software release and major APIs change and people who are really comfortable with the old stuff are maybe not as comfortable with the new stuff. Those are the times you might slip back into like a storming phase or slip back into a norming phase where you have to revisit how you're going to do things to be productive. Uh, and that's okay. And as we wrote the presentation, we tried to make it so that those same steps you could go back and revisit during the sort of retrograde motions back through those particular periods and say, okay, okay, these are a couple of strategies we can use and, and try out. Um, many years after he wrote his first paper, you know, forming, storming, uh, norming, and conforming, he realized that he might have missed something. And so later on, he came back and offered a final uh, step, a fifth step that he called adjourning. And this is a step that we've all seen happen with open source projects as maintainership kind of quiets down, the project is no longer quite as relevant, uh, and, and it's time to just say, hey, we, we, we did a good job, we, uh, we worked really hard on this, uh, and, and we're kind of done. Uh, we didn't have any particular big insights we wanted to add to that, but we did want to point out that that too is a natural phase of many uh, open source projects and also the natural phase of a conference talk. So if you have any <laughs> if you have any questions, otherwise we too will adjourn. Uh, Are you doing this? Yeah, yeah okay. sure, that's fine. Let's let's pass this around, sir. Hi, I really liked what you said about the emeritus maintainers. Do you have any suggestions for recognizing and elevating particularly non-code contributors, but people who are active and supportive of the project in a way that makes them irreplaceable or, or very notably helpful? 
That's a good question. Do you want to take that? Um, I mean, you I, are, you, I can, you have been one on many projects. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I do a lot of the community non code work for our projects, and I've been recognized as such as being like a maintainer or like, I'm like maintainer, a maintainer of several of our community repos, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the public way that I've been recognized and like have that in writing, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking more about like someone who's currently doing stuff or maybe down the line? I guess you could still do the Meredith thing down the line as well too. Well, even to get to the, the community part. So with a lot of our projects, we'll take the, the GitHub org for the project. So slash helm, and then there's slash helm is the code repository, charts is the other, and community is one of them. And we will often put people who do a lot of design work, Karen who does a lot of community work, Bridget who does a lot of community work and, and documentation work, people, people like that will go in there. Docs repositories will often separate out from the code repositories. We used to keep the two together for the simple reason that then you could pull request, one pull request with a feature change and a doc change. But over time we realized that uh, there were a lot of specialist activities that you could do in a docs repository. And so we started breaking those out. And then we started assigning maintainers who were doc maintainers who could who would really focus on everything from, uh, and, and correct, feel free to jump up and correct me if I'm wrong, but like the consistency of the documentation when we got into translation, managing translations, uh, 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 making sure the quick start guide and the reference material is all up to date. And so then we would make maintainers of a community repo that focused on some of that, maintainers of the docs repo that focused on that. So we didn't necessarily give them titles different than core maintainer. We just split up our repos. Now I imagine you could definitely just say, we're gonna have a category called docs maintainer or docs uh, and, and code, code maintainer or something like that, but that wasn't anything we've tried out. Awesome. Tria oh, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that's really good. So in Helm, we introduced, tri sorry, I just- Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, triage, we introduced triage maintainers recently because what we were discovering was the issue queue was getting out of control and we were getting burned out just triaging the issue queue. And a lot of times those were questions where somebody could answer in two sentences or point them to the documentation. So we introduced a new category of maintainer called triage maintainer that they don't, I mean, they're certainly welcome to open PRs and stuff, but they're not obligated to review PRs and things like that, but they're empowered to be able to go through and label issues and close issues and, and stuff like that. And that, for a project the size of Helm, has been a tremendous boon to us. It's been very, very helpful. Um, I was gonna say, I don't know that you're like gonna hit any resistance for this as well, but one of the arguments that I would like to make for you know getting people who are doing non-code contributions listed as maintainers is like, for like a lot of our projects, because they're CNCF projects, there's a lot of communications that have or communication that happens between CNCF and the project. And as someone who does the community work, like if I'm not listed as a maintainer, I don't get those emails. <laughs> um, so like functionally, there's a reason to add someone who does not encode work as well. Um, yeah. Okay, one more question. You've worked the two of you have worked on large projects that are graduated CNCF projects like Helm, but you've recently been starting some small new projects. Can you talk a little bit about people who might see all of the work that goes into a giant project like Helm and say, wait, what if I'm just starting? Can you give a few tips for people who are starting a project like, say, Crosslet? Yeah. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? You go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, Again, some of those first ones in the forming phase to expand a little about some of those that we think are really important. Um, so the metaphor we'd like to use is uh, it has to do with circles, all right? In the very first days of a project, before we get into a, the, the topics of, uh, of this kind of thing, you imagine you got your close circle of people who are working together on the code and you're all kind of huddled together looking inward and saying, okay, how are we going to design this? How are we going to code that? Then you get to kind of this first phase where you're ready to start community building. And the metaphor we always use is, okay, so you got this group of people and they all stand up and they all kind of turn away so they're facing outward. And the metaphor is designed to say, you know, everybody's got each other's back because that first phase can be kind of rough, right? Uh, you're gonna get challenged a lot on your assumptions. Everybody's got each other's back, but at the same time you're facing outward and starting to bring people in. And so you have to make some very intentional moves at that point to say, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, sometimes we might be a little overly uh, enthusiastic on Twitter about what we're working on and how excited we are about it. But the idea is to start bringing people in. And hopefully some percentage of those people will like the project and want to stick around and use it. And then some percentage of those people who stick around and use it will want to start working with you on it. 
And so a lot of that, like after the 1.0 phase, so much of the effort is really that outward communication thing. But the goal of that, among the other goals, one of the main goals of that in this circle metaphor is that you start building up a concentric circle around you of other people who are interested. And then at some point, you start to sort of reform. And some people start working on 1.1 or 2.0, right? And so they sort of turn back in and start working again while the outer concentric ring is still facing outward and bringing in more people and trying to evangelize. And that's when you're really getting more into the, into the norming phase, right? That third phase where it's all about introducing some process and you are working for these kind of concentric rings. So to answer Bridget's question most directly then, uh, that, that, that turn out, that initial turn outward when you really start focusing time that would otherwise be engineering time on making people feel welcome, on, you know, thinking hard about those PRs and leaving some, some positive comments as well as negative comments, on thanking people for filing issues when admittedly sometimes you're like, oh, right? Uh, but it's all about you know, respecting people where they're at and trying to build up that next concentric route. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know like like we've worked on bigger projects, but I just want to say a lot of what we say applies to all projects um, because we, yeah, we would have had to start at the beginning for even our small projects, even though we've been doing this for a while. And then again, just like I said, think about things before they're a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, that is, that, uh, that is so true. Yeah. yeah there, code of conduct should go in your repo in the first, uh, along with stuff. the license on, on day yeah. one, right? Yeah. That You just will spare yourself a lot of problems with yeah. that. Because again, your goal in this community building phase is to make the right space for the discussion to be about what you're trying to build and how you're going to do it, not, and not having jerky people come in and ruin the, the exact thing you're trying to do. Right? Because it's setting the right tone at the beginning. Yeah. 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 And I really feel very strongly that what sets open source software apart from any other, you know, commercial proprietary doesn't really matter is the fact that when you start to build these communities, we build much better things when we're working together. Uh, collectively, we're smarter about these things. And not handling code of conduct issues will just destroy that right away. Uh, so. so we have time for one more question. One more question, like four minutes or something? Yeah. Um, I'll pick uh, right in the back, actually. Huh? It's like the game show thing where they run up the aisle and then hand over the mic to somebody else. And... Is this on? Okay. Yep. I, I, I hope this is relevant. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how to make your community inclusive, given that you know many people are dedicating their free time. You might have a handful of people who are paid to work on the project. How do you make sure that you're giving those people who just have a few minutes to spare all the opportunity to um, participate. I have lots. Of Go for it. Because <laughs> I, uh, early on in, uh, in Helm, I was in a talk with another open source project and it surfaced that the number one point of contention in the group was time zones because they had some people in Australia some people in Europe, some people in North America, and they were always trying to figure out a time zone that worked. And that was a really good indicator early on that there were all kinds of things, all kinds of things to consider when you're talking about uh, improving the diversity and inclusivity of your project. And I definitely am not an expert on this. It has been, I've struggled many times myself to figure out how to build those things in. But I think the first step would be to start to acknowledge all the different things. And, and you raised a great one. Like some people, like, like me, like Karen and I, are paid to work on this stuff full time. It's very easy for us to show up between nine and five and do our stuff and then check out at five. Whereas a whole batch of people are showing up at five going, well, I got, or 5.30 going, I got 20 minutes of time before dinner. I wonder what I can do. Uh, the triage maintainer role was, I think, one of the most interesting ones that we did. And, Part of the reasoning behind the triaging role was that we had a lot of people uh, in, in China and in Asia who wanted to be able to contribute to Helm, but their work cycle was off the clock of almost all the other Helm maintainers. And so it was a way to start to do things asynchronously so that they could jump in at the triage role and start working on that and then work their way toward a core maintainership without having to necessarily show up and meet everybody during you know, what would effectively be the middle of the night. Uh, 
a lot of what Karen has done and a lot of what Bridget has done and and uh, Karina, who is not in the in the room, but is also one of the PMs on Helm, have all worked very hard when we did this contributor summit uh, to figure out ways that we could start identifying people early based on their interests and helping them kind of get plugged in so that we could streamline the process of getting them in. Because otherwise, what we noticed happened was that the loudest ones were the ones who got considered for something, right? It was the ones who were there the most and who were uh, commenting on the most number of issues, which while a good indicator of their interest and expertise is not the only indicator of interest and expertise. So we're getting better. I don't know, are there other things we've done that? I think we're at time. Oh, oh. <laughs> We're, we're at time here, so there's one question from online, but we'll probably wrap that up after this session. So um, to Jim, who's online, thank you for that question, and I'll make sure that um, Karen and Matt see to it. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.